welcome to MK's Exam Secrets. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we look at six exam questions in one clinical course. This is season one, episode seven, Pediatrics. Now, before we get into the video, I'd like to give a big shout out to each and every one of you individuals for showing the love, hitting the subscribe button, and we managed to cross 500 subscribers. It, we have really come a long way growing as a channel. And I thank each and every one of you. I wish I could buy you all the world. But for now, I think let me just give you these videos. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button. Hit the like button if you want more of such content. And drop a comment. Share the link with someone who you think it may help. And grab your piece of paper, grab your pen, and let's go. So beginning with our question one. Mapesho is... A happy little boy aged four years. One day he wakes up with orbital swelling, which soon disappears as the day progresses. His mother also notes that his legs and feet are swollen and he seems more tired than usual. Question A, what is the diagnosis? Question B, what tests will you order in order to help in your diagnosis? Question C, Mapesha responds well to initial treatment. What is the most likely histological type of disease? And question D, give one histological investigation you need to perform. So I'll give you a three second interval to think through this question. So you get a child that has swelling around the eyes and swelling around the legs and the feet. So this child has edema. So remember that whenever you are considering someone who has edema, the problem could either be number one, they're not taking enough protein, so their oncotic pressure is less. It could be their diet. They may be losing their proteins in their diet, like for example, if they have a protein losing enteropathy, or they're not synthesizing enough proteins in the case of them having a chronic liver disease. So the problem could be with the liver. Additionally, the problem could be with the heart, where the heart isn't functioning and it's failing, and then there's increase in hydrostatic pressure because blood is pooling in the venous system, and there is transudation of fluid and hence edema. And then you could think maybe these proteins are being lost in the kidneys. And if they're being lost in the kidneys, you're losing your oncotic pressure. So it means more fluid is leaving the vascular space and accumulating in these areas that are dependent or areas that may allow for this fluid to accumulate. And most of the times, the areas are going to be around the eyes. So these people with kidney diseases or kidney conditions are going to wake up with swelling around the eyes. So most likely this child has nephrotic syndrome. What test will you order that will help in your diagnosis? So a very specific test that you can order is actually known as a urine albumin creatinine ratio. It's much more accurate or much more sensitive than a protein creatinine ratio and way much more sensitive than your 24-hour urine protein collection test or your spot uh, dipstick. That's your urine dipsticks. So you could order for a urine albumin creatinine ratio. You can order for a protein creatinine ratio. You could order for uh, a urinalysis. You could order for a urine microscopy culture sensitivity. You may order also for the urea electrolytes and the creatinine. Then question C. Mapesha responds well to initial treatment. What is the most likely histological type? So this is obviously minimal change disease. Remember that there is membranous nephropathy, focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. There is also minimal uh, change disease. So this is obviously minimal change disease, which is the one that responds most commonly to steroids. And it's the one that's more common in the pediatric age group. Give one histological investigation you need to perform. So you may need to do an immunofluorescence, which may actually show you different patterns that may be there. They may be granular, they may be linear patterns, depending on the histological type that you have. Question two, Mwetwa and Mwembe are siblings, aged five and eight years respectively. They are brought by ambulance to the emergency room from Chongwe and are wheeled on, in on stretches. Both are unable to talk and are very weak. The ambulance nurse reports that Mwembe has convulsed three times since they began their journey earlier in the day. You make a quick assessment and realize that Mwembe is not only unresponsive, but is severely pale, has cold, ex cold peripheries, a thready pulse, as well as delayed capillary refill time of four seconds. Her brother, Mwetwa, responds weakly when he is called. 
He appears jaundiced and is also pale. His random blood sugar is 1.8 and his core temperature is 39.7. Question A, what is the most likely diagnosis? So if you think of this question, you have two siblings that are coming in from an area outside Lusaka. Chongo is an area out, like on the outskirts of Lusaka, if I may say. Correct me if I'm wrong. So in Chongwe, they may have contracted something that is making them present in a similar way. So it's most likely that what they have contracted is an infectious thing. Number one, because it's happening acutely. Number two, they have similar symptoms that they are presenting with. And of course, they're presenting at the same time. So most likely, if you're thinking of Chongwe and you're thinking of someone who is unconscious or convulsing and they have fe uh, features of shock, they also have features of hypoglycemia, then you obviously this is a severe malaria. So these children have severe malaria. What complications of this condition have the siblings developed? So if we read through the question, we, has, we see that this person is unable to talk and weak, okay, and convulsed three times. So if you have a generalized tonic-clonic convulsions, two or more generalized tonic-clonic convulsions in 24 hours attributed to no other cause but malaria or an unarousable state, attributed to no other cause but malaria, you refer to that as cerebral malaria. So the first complication that we can note from this question is cerebral malaria. The second thing that we can note is that this person is severely pale, so they could have a severe anemia. The other thing is that they have cold periphery, thready pulse, and delayed capillary refill time, so it means that they're in shock. We refer to that as algid malaria. Of course, they check there's jaundice there, so that could be that there's some hepatic dysfunction. And... The blood sugar is 1.8, that is hypoglycemia, and the core temperature is 39.7, hyperpyrexia. Though some literature emphasize that the temperature should be above 41 degrees Celsius, others state 40, other literature state that it should just be above 39 degrees Celsius to consider it as hyperpyrexia. Then what is the most likely reason why Mwetwa is jaundiced? So there, there are three main reasons why you get jaundice in malaria patients. One reason is that these intravascular hemolysis, remember that the parasites themselves are found in the red blood cells. So they may produce some toxins such as hemozoin that may actually lead to the ultimate rapture of the red blood cells. And remember when red blood cells rapture, they release their hemoglobin and hemoglobin is supposed to be broken down and eventually catabolized into bilirubin that can accumulate in the blood and deposit in the tissues resulting in the jaundice. Additionally, the jaundice may be as a result of disseminated intravascular coagulation where you have activation of these clotting factors and widespread coagulation forming such that you decrease the lumen of the red blood cells such that whenever a red blood cells passes through this decreased lumen, it gets hemolyzed. And whenever it's hemolyzed, increase hemoglobin load, increase metabolism of hemoglobin, hence the jaundice because there's a lot of bilirubin. Then rarely... You can also have what is known as malaria hepatitis, where there is inflammation of the liver. And remember that the liver is responsible for conjugation of bilirubin, which is the addition of glucuronic acid to bilirubin to make it more water-soluble. So if the liver is inflamed, it may not do this effectively. And most of the bilirubin will, will remain unconjugated and it may deposit in the sclera and the mucous membranes lead into the jaundice. So those are the three main causes why this child is jaundiced then give two ways how this condition can be prevented so number one is vector eradication so you can clean out the surroundings of the house remove any stagnant water and of course perform in indoor residual spraying okay wear protective clothing use uh, repellents mosquito repellent sleep under a permethrin treated mosquito net and of course, health education. You could choose just two of those. Question three. Taonga is a 15-year-old girl who comes to the OPD with a five-day history of headache, lightheadedness. She feels weak and tires easily. She hasn't been able to attend her netball practice at school in the past month. She attained Menaki at 11 years and usually has heavy menstruation. When you evaluate her, you realize she is quite pale and she has a tachycardia. You ask for a quick FBC and the results are as follows. HB 7.2, MCV 59, 
MCHC26 and MCH21. What type of anemia does she have and what is the cause? So as you can see, her HB is low, 7.2, that's quite low. Her MCV is low, 59. Her MCHC is low, 26. Her MCH is 21, that's pretty low. So obviously this child has microcytic, hypochromic type of anemia, most likely secondary to um, iron deficiency anemia, and which is obviously also due to menorrhagia, which is the heavy menses that she's been experiencing. So describe what you what you expect to see on her blood uh, film. So you'd expect to see number one target cells, which may also be referred to as codocytes. You you may see these pencil shaped cells, which is known as a poikilocytosis. Sometimes there may be a variation in the different sizes of the red blood cells, which you refer to as anisocytosis. You may also see these microcytic cells, which are these small cells that appear pale. So you refer to that as microcytosis. Then what test will confirm her anemia? You would obviously do an iron studies. This is where you look at things like iron, serum iron, which of course will be low. You look at serum ferritin, which will be low. The serum ferritin, remember, is the storage form of iron. You look at the total iron binding capacity, which is pretty much measuring the amount of transferrin you have in your body. So the total iron binding capacity will be increased, of course, and then you look at the percentage saturation of the transferrin molecule, it will be reduced less than the normal, which is roughly around 30 to 33%. Then question D, give other common causes of the disease causing her type of anemia in pediatric practice. So one cause it could be that there's hookworm infestation. Remember, kids like to play in soil and they can accumulate these hookworms. Nicata americanus and Calostoma diodinale. Number two is, of course, malnutrition. So there may be some dietary deficiencies. And number three, you can get a child that's born prematurely or you can get a child that's born with a low birth weight. Those are some of the causes of iron deficiency and AB. Question number four. Chola is a 12-month-old who walks around with a swollen belly. She has persistent constipation, noticed she, since she was a baby, and it does not get better with the usual drugs. Sometimes she vomits brown, smelly vomitus and has abdominal pains. She is failing to thrive. Two weeks ago, the doctor inserted a finger into her rectum and there was an explosive discharge of a lot of stool. What is your diagnosis? Briefly describe the pathogenesis of the condition. List three investigations you would order. What is the management of this child? So this is a child that has been coming in with problems with them being able to pass stool. And these are stemming from as far as since they were born. So it means that this may have been a congenital thing. They may have been born with this thing. And the fact that the usual drugs aren't really responding to it, meaning that there could be a problem inherently wrong with the bowel. So most likely this child has high sprung's disease. Briefly describe the pathogenesis of the condition. So this is obviously failure of migration of the myenteric and the submucosal plexus, the ganglia in this myenteric and submucosal plexus, obviously to the distal part of the bowel. Sometimes it can actually affect the whole colon. Then list three investigations you would order. So you would order for a plain x-ray, which is obviously going to be showing you abdominal distension. That may be there and distension of the bowel. You may do a barium enema x-ray. You may do a rectal biopsy. Then what is the management of this condition? So you want to give fluids to this child that may be dehydrated. You want to cover them on antibiotics to prevent any infections. You want to irrigate the bowel in order to clear it out and reduce the distension. And of course, surgical intervention is the mainstay management where you're going to remove the agonglionic bowel segment. Remember that there's a complication of shortcut syndrome long term. Question five, match the word or phrase on the left with the appropriate relevant phrase on the right. So we'll begin with this. So enteric fever here. So enteric fever, let's see the options. Prematurity, no, 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 no. So it's obviously intestinal perforation. Plasmodium falciparum is histidine-rich protein 2. Breast milk has a high concentration of secretory IgA and lactoferrin. Ballot score is used in prematurity. Sickle cell anemia is going to go with the gangrene. Pulsus paradoxus is obviously seen in severe asthmatic attack. A boot-shaped 
a heart is seen in tetralogy of Fallot. Meningo uh, coxemia is an encapsulated bacteria. Respiratory distress syndrome is due to surfactant deficiency. And heavy proteinuria is seen in minimal change nephrosis. Question six, and indeed the final question. Rupande, a 10-year-old boy, is brought into the emergency room with a history of difficulty breathing since the previous night. He is a known sickle cell patient who has had several of us occlusive crises monthly. Write down two ways you would manage this patient besides the usual IV fluids and analgesia. So the first thing that you would do is you may give the child hydroxyurea because they've been having recurrent vasoclusive crises. And the other thing is that you could do these monthly blood transfusions. Then during one of the painful crises, he presents with fever, respiratory embarrassment, give to possible differentials whenever you get someone presenting with you with these chest symptoms shortness of breath difficulty in breathing tachypnea it may be that they have an infection so it could be a bacterial pneumonia or it could be an acute chest syndrome where you exacerbate a vasoclusive crisis predominantly in the lungs then write down two possible causative organisms of the above differentials so it could be streptococcal pneumonia or mycoplasma pneumonia then mention two groups of antibiotics you would give to manage the differentials. So you could use either macrolides, which are very good, and penicillins. So because we reached 500 subscribers, I've dropped you a bonus question. Please let me know in the comment section below about your answers. I'm really curious to find out what you think about this question. So Samper is a seven-year-old boy who presents with a 13-day cough and fever that is unresponsive to intravenous antibiotics. Even though her RDT for malaria was negative, uh, she received an anti-malarial treatment at the beginning of the fever. The mother thinks that uh, he has lost some weight. On examination, he has enlarged lymph nodes in the neck bilaterally, crepitations in the chest, and hepatomegaly. What is the most likely diagnosis? What investigations are you going to order that will aid in your diagnosis? You perform a lymph node biopsy. Give to histopathological appearance description of what, what is seen. Name the most common drugs that are used in the management of this condition. So drop your answers in the comments below and I will pin the answer or the answers that I think are most correct at the top of the comments. So do not forget to subscribe if you haven't. Drop a like, drop a comment, share the video. Thank you for helping me reach 500 subscribers let's keep on subscribing and sharing so that we reach 1000 subscribers until next time my name is dr moses kazebu bye bye